not talking. That will help with the feedback. Um, and then as far as the CE credits for this uh, presentation from Dr. Lichtenstein will be available after the, after the session today. In the invite, uh, you would have received some information on a link so that you can go in and retrieve those CE credits or CME credits. Um, and if Dr. Lichtenstein, you can go to the next slide. There is a number that you utilize to put into um, the information that's requested and your your name. Um, and then if you can just remember in the chat today, if you can just send us um, if you are a nurse or if you're a nurse practitioner, advanced provider or a physician, that helps us to make sure that we account for everybody on the attendance list from today's session. So I am going to kick it over to Alicia Irving, who's going to do the introduction today for Dr. Lichtenstein. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Thank, thank you for joining today. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Lichtenstein, gastroenterologist at Mercy Catholic Medical Center, Trinity Health Mid-Atlantic. He is board certified and has three areas of specialty, internal medicine, gastroenterology, and hepatology, with two practice locations in Springfield and Darby, Delaware County. Dr. Lichtenstein graduated from Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and did his residency and fellowship at Mercy Catholic Medical Center. He is chair of GI and clinical professor of medicine at PCOM. His expertise is valued by students and the residents that he mentors. He has held leadership roles at MCMC and contributed to many programmatic implementations, expansion of GI services across the region, and successful initiatives at Trinity Health Mid-Atlantic. Our direct access program at Mercy GI serves the needs of our community by making preventative screening easier to access. Dr. Lichtenstein has been recognized as a top doc for the past four years in various publications across the Philadelphia region. He's a valued leader, member of medical staff, our specialty physician group, and a key collaborator with physicians. He's always willing to meet with our community physicians and, provi and providers to educate on GI services at Mercy Fitzgerald and Trinity Health Mid-Atlantic, as well as to ensure he's, he is available to you personally. Thank you, Dr. Lichtenstein, for your contributions and service. I'll turn it over you, to you to begin. Well, wow, thanks, Alicia. <laughs> That's uh, that's quite an introduction. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thanks everybody for uh, joining for this session. I picked a topic that I th I think for a noon time on a Friday at the end of the week. I didn't want to get too bogged down with too much details, but I think this is a topic that everybody can learn a little bit more about. You know, GERD. So gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now people might think, oh, this again, GERD. We know everything about reflux. Well, I, I think you're going to come up come away with some pearls that you'll find very useful for your practice in a, in a very short period of time during this lecture. So GERD, NERD, and BE, what's really going on down there, come see. Um, there's a lot of truth to that title, um, and we'll, we'll go forward and we'll explain that to you. So basic GERD, everybody seems to know what GERD is, gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the definition of GERD, chronic symptoms, or mucosal damage produced by the abnormal reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus. Great, everybody seems to know that. Well, there's two types of reflux. There's erosive esophagitis, GERD, but then there's non-erosive reflux disease, or NERD, and that's endoscopy negative reflux. So what that is, is a patient can come to your office, have typical symptoms of reflux, regurgitation, heartburn, water brush, things like that. But if we perform an endoscopy on that patient, that patient may have no erosions down there. They may have endoscopy negative. Just because the endoscopy or the esophagus is negative and free of erosions does not mean, does not mean that they're not refluxing. So the, the problem with this is you cannot tell, or one cannot tell by symptoms alone whether that patient will have erosions called GERD or have no erosions down there called NERD. There's no way to distinguish that by symptoms alone. Now, if you pause and think about that, to me, that's a very scary concept that we don't talk about as much. So, you know, somebody can come in and have rip-roaring esophagitis to your office or rip-roaring heartburn. They can say, Doc, I suffer with heartburn two or three times a day. I get it every day. And another patient can come in and say, yeah, I get heartburn once or twice a month. And just by that alone, you cannot tell whether somebody's going to have erosions down there or have a normal esophagus down there. Yet they're still refluxing. 
Hey, Dr. Lichtenstein. Sorry, yeah. it's Nicole. Um, we're not seeing your slides advance. I'm still on the first slide. You see that advance? We. I'm still on the disclosure. Is anybody else having that problem? Yeah, so I only see the disclosure yes. as well. Yep. Huh. All right, so. So I, I know you can toggle on the bottom of your screen and move your slides forward yourself to stay up with Dr. Lichtenstein, or I can, um, or we can try to reset the presentation. So if everybody wants to just kind of toggle on the bottom and Dr. Lichtenstein just say, you know, you're moving to the next slide so we can keep up with you. Okay. Does that work? Yeah. All right. Thanks everybody. Sorry about that. So is everybody on the GERD slides? Is GERD on top? All right, we'll do that. Um, so, again, GERD and NERD, you cannot tell by symptoms whether somebody's going to have erosions of the esophagus or non-erosions. And there's a significance to that because we feel that patients with erosive esophagitis have a higher um, chance of possibly developing complications of reflux, including Barrett's esophagus and stricture formation. Whereas the NERD patient, even though the symptoms are similar, they may have less of a chance of developing Barrett's or complications of long-standing acid reflux. So that's an important point. Next slide. Next slide has the three bullets where it says erosive esophagitis. So erosive esophagitis can lead to chronic mucosal damage and long-term complications, which is, which is what we're concerned about, including esophageal strictures, Barrett's esophagus, that's what BE stands for, Barrett's esophagus, and ultimately adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. We do not suspect the same for NERD. Uh, and again, there is no significant correlation between the severity of reflux symptoms and differ differentiating between NERD and GERD. Uh, I'll take that one step further. There's no correlation with the severity of symptoms and the degree of esophagitis. We'll, we'll see later on that there's different degrees of esophagitis, grades A, B, C, and D and C and D being the most severe forms of esophagitis, grades A and B being the, the most minor um, cases of it. But there's, you cannot tell by symptoms whether the patient is going to have a rip-roaring esophagitis, very ugly and angry looking and inflamed versus a minimal to, to hardly any inflammation down there. That's another scary um, thought. So I want to throw up this case study and I want to dissect this a little bit because it's a very Simple case, but yet one that we see all the time, many times every day. So a 55-year-old obese white male presents to your office complaining of frequent heartburn symptoms. Uh, the frequency is about three to four times a week for the past 20 years. The symptoms are often nocturnal. He takes over-the-counter antacids with relief. He has no alarm symptoms or red flags. So when we think of alarm symptoms or red flags, um, we think of dysphagia, odynophagia, vomiting up blood, right? blood in the stool, unintentional weight loss, fever, atypical chest pain, things like that. So he has, you know, he has none of those symptoms. He's a relatively healthy guy besides his weight, and he just suffers with heartburn. So my question is, then how would you treat a guy like this? We see this all the time. Would you initiate step-up therapy? So step-up therapy would be you start him at the lowest a uh, form of treatment, whether it's dietary modifications, lifestyle modifications, losing weight, things like that. And if that doesn't um, solve his complaints, then you step it up to the next level, which may be H2 blockers. And then if that doesn't work and you still have him breakthrough, then you step up the therapy to even more potent acid suppression with proton pump inhibitors. So that's step up therapy. And there's, there's a role for that. Or would you treat him with step down therapy? Would you start with the most potent of acid suppression, which is proton pump inhibitors, try and get his symptoms controlled and then wean him down and step him down after so many weeks to maybe see if you can get him controlled on H2 blockers and wean him down that way. Uh, there's two different schools of thought. Everybody has their own preference. Uh, and, a, and a gentleman like this, if he showed up to my office, uh, I don't use either of those. I use the step-in therapy. And what I call a step-in therapy is Someone like this who's had frequent heartburn and, and long-term symptoms, I'd like to shut him down and get him cooled off as quickly as possible. So I'll go right in with the proton pump and therapy. sometimes BID. I'll do high dose, but at least once a day. 
Um, I don't mess around with lower lower therapies in, the, in a general like this. And when I say step in, oftentimes I'll have to leave them on the proton pump inhibitor. I'm unable to wean them down for a gentleman like this. And the data also shows that 75 to 90 percent of patients who are on acid suppression, it's it's very difficult to get them off their acid suppression. Most people who need to go on therapy, if they fail lifestyle modifications and dietary modifications, you're unable to get them off. So I, I leave them on their therapy. And there's reasons for that, which we'll come up to later. Um, some of the concerning uh, presentation with this gentleman is the followers. So what bothers me about this gentleman? It's a very simple case, right? Typical case that we see every day. Well, his age of 55 years, he's middle aged. So middle age is, is somewhat of a minor concern for me. What else in his history? He's obese. So when it comes to reflux, that's also a minor concern. And we'll tie all this in later. Uh, he's a white male. So being a white male, is, he has a higher um, predisposition to developing Barrett's esophagus. So white male, middle-aged white males is a little bit of a red flag for me. Uh, his frequent symptoms. He's having heartburn symptoms three to four times a week. That's a lot. It's not one or two a month. It's three to four times a week. So that is, again, another typical red flag for me for, for complications of reflux. And then the long-term symptoms. He's had this for 20 years. So that bothers me a lot. And then the last thing that bothers me in this presentation of this gentleman is nocturnal symptoms. He's having most of the symptoms he states that wakes him from sleep. Two, three in the morning, he's waking up with severe heartburn, like a choking sensation. And during the day, it's not as bad. Nocturnal symptoms of heartburn, um, to me, are uh, more of a red flag than daytime heartburn. We'll go into that. So there are the things that bother me about about his presentation. Um, let's start with um, step up therapy. So lifestyle and dietary modifications. What's been proven in the literature is that weight loss and elevating the head of the bed <clears throat> on six inch blocks uh, has been proven to be beneficial to reduce reflux. That's, that's data driven. Um, I tell my patients, don't prop pillows behind their neck or their upper body raise the whole head of the bed under the legs of the head of the bed, you know, at least three, maybe six inches. Because when you prop pillows behind your back, you're actually bending at the waist. And when you bend at the waist, at times you're increasing intra-abdominal pressure. When you increase intra-abdominal pressure, you can actually make reflux worse. So you want to lie supine and as flat as possible, but you want to raise your whole body on an incline, not just your upper part where you're bending at the waist. So I, I'm very... Um, uh, conscious when I tell them how to how to raise the head of the bed. And then, of course, avoidance of the trigger foods. So these foods here, fatty foods, caffeine, and carminative, spearmint and peppermint, they have been shown to reduce your lower esophageal sphincter pressure, which is one of the main reasons why patients suffer with acid reflux. When you have a uh, reduction in your lower esophageal sphincter pressure, that adds the acid reflux and induces that. Fatty foods, caffeine, and spearmint have a direct effect of doing that on the LES, or lower esophageal sphincter. So that's why we tell them to avoid those things. Even um, eating three large meals a day, consuming that, is worse than maybe breaking your meals down to six small meals a day. I mean, physiologic responses, when you put a lot of pressure, large meals into your stomach, physiologic, our body wants to equalize that pressure that's in the stomach. So your lower esophageal sphincter will relax and to equalize the pressure up with the esophagus. Well, when that LES relaxes, it's going to want to share that pressure of the stomach and that will allow the acid reflux uh, to take in, to kick in pathologic reflux. So what we try and tell our patients is eating smaller meals throughout the day is more beneficial than larger meals. Um, when it comes to spicy and acidic uh, foods, you know, that doesn't have it does not have a direct effect on the LES. So if you have erosions down there that aren't healed, the patients will feel burning. I don't get too concerned with that. If they say, Doc, I can eat spicy and acidic foods and it doesn't bother me, I let them I let them have that as long as um, you know the erosions are are healed. They shouldn't have a big issue with that. And if they do, then then then, then we stop it. Avoid tight fitting clothes. You know, tight fitting clothes it acts like obesity. It's increasing intra-abdominal pressure, adding to acid reflux up into the esophagus. Tobacco and alcohol have a direct effect on the LES by relaxing it. So we tell them to avoid that. 
And then another big thing is avoid eating within three hours before bedtime when you lie supine and you have a full stomach, of course. Your um, acid is going crazy, producing a ton of acid. And now you take gravity out of the picture by lying supine and you're allowing for um, increase of acid into the esophagus that way. So you tell, tell, them, tell them to avoid that. And then I consider promoting salivation. So chewing los, uh, gum or oral lozenges will help promote bicarb secretion and help neutralize any pathologic acid that remains up in the esophagus. So they can uh, sometimes get some improvement with that. Next slide. Uh, then we go into some medications. So medications and acids. If you want something to work quickly and to have instant relief within minutes of acid reflux and heartburn, suck on an, an acid or take a swig of Maalox. That works. The problem with it is it doesn't last long. And there's no data to prove significant healing if the patient suffers from erosive esophagitis. There's no uh, beneficial healing rates with taking in acids. So it works quick, but no healing. You can look at surface agents, so, you know, sucralfate, carafate, and then the um, sodium alginate. I think that used to be called Brioski, I think. Uh, I don't know if I still sell that. And that they're topical agents, and they, uh, that can also help with acid reflux in, in, in certain patients. I don't use that routinely, but it is part of our armamentarium if, if it's out there if we need to use it. Then we go to H2 blockers. Uh, we all know H2 blockers inhibit the histamine uh, receptor on the gastroparietal cell. And then the most potent of all acid inhibitors is the proton pump inhibitor. And that irreversibly binds the um, hydrogen potassium ATPase um, on the gastroparietal cell. PPIs again are the most potent. Next slide. PPIs are the most potent of all the acid inhibitors. It's proven to be the most efficacious in symptom relief, and it's proven to be the best available to heal all grades of erosive esophagitis A through D. Nothing better than the PPI out there. So next slide. I want to show you uh, four pictures of when I say grades of esophagitis A, B, C, and D. I want to put a, a visual out there for you. So this is grade A esophagitis, and there's definitions below the picture to explain what that is. And this came out because years ago, the docs, GI docs would say a uh, patient has mild esophagitis or moderate esophagitis or severe. And those descriptive terms, there was never any, um, it, 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 too much variability amongst providers as to what maybe if I call something moderate esophagitis, my colleague would call it severe or mild. So we never really knew um, universally what we were talking about. This puts some objectivity to those terms now. So grade A esophagitis has a definition of one or more mucosal breaks, no longer than five millimeters, not bridging the tops of mucosal folds. And mucosal breaks are defined as an area of slough or erythema with a discrete line of demarcation from the adjacent, more normal looking mucosa. So you see what that is looking like. Then you go to grade B esophagitis. So grade B esophagitis is one or more mucosal, next slide, one or more mucosal breaks, longer than five millimeters, but not bridging the tops of mucosal folds. And then next slide shows you grade C esophagitis, and that's one, one or more mucosal breaks, bridging the tops of mucosal folds involving less than 75% of the circumference. And then grade D, next slide, is the most severe of all the esophagitis. Um, hey, Dr. Lichtenstein, your slides disappeared. I'm gonna quick share my screen from where, where I have it, okay? Sure. And then just tell me to, to advance it. You got does it. There, does everybody see my slides? Yes. All right. Yes. All right, so so I, grade, we, we grade lost B? slides at grade B. All right. So let's so go to grade C. There you go. All right. So grade, grade C esophagitis. You can see the picture there with grade C. And then go on to grade D esophagitis. Next slide. So I guess what I need you guys to know about that is when your patient gets endoscoped and they have grade C or grade D esophagitis by, by the GI doc, those patients need to have a follow-up endoscopy eight to 10 weeks after treatment. Because the problem with grade C and grade D esophagitis is you cannot tell, given the extent of inflammation, if there's underlying Barrett's mucosa. So the more severe esophagitis may mask Barrett's. And that's the, one of the whole ideas of looking and performing endoscopies to make sure there's no Barrett's esophagus. So grade C and D need to be followed up once it's healed to make sure you're not missing Barrett's. Grades A and B, um, 
Those are more mild forms of esophagitis where we can usually pick up a Barrett's esophagus and they necessarily do not need to have another endoscopy. All right, next slide. So as a review, some typical symptoms of GERD. We all know the, the, the list on the left, heartburn, regurgitation, dysphagia. They're the typical um, GERD symptoms. But if you look on the right, I just wanted to put a reminder. Some of these are extra-intestinal, uh, I call manifestations of GERD. So chronic cough could be a sign of GERD, chronic sore throat, globus sensation. A globus sensation is when a patient says, Doc, you know, I feel like I have a lump in my throat. And there's no blockage down it, but they feel like it's a ping pong ball stuck in their throat. And that uh, has been associated with um, reflux. Excessive dental cavities could be a sign of acid reflux. Atypical chest pain. So we see that quite often. You know, patient has chest pain. They get worked up by cardiology. Uh, cardiac workup is negative. The next step should be come to GI because it could be GERD. It could be esophageal motility as the next most common cause of atypical chest pain. Uh, chronic nausea, chronic hoarseness, excessive throat clearing, and asthma and wheezing attack could all be due to um, acid reflux. So a patient may not necessarily present with the list on the left with typical symptoms. They may have these right uh, symptoms on the right, and I think you have to have a high index of suspicion that it could be reflux related. Next slide. So when when should primary care docs refer to GI or ENT docs or wherever? When do they need to see somebody like me? Well, presence of alarm or red flag symptoms. I think that's a given. We can review that now. If they have atypical chest pain, that's that should come to GI. If they have vomiting of blood, hematemesis, of course that comes to GI. They need to have investigation. If they have heme positive stool, so if they have occult blood in their stool for no other reason, maybe they're having blood into the GI tract from the esophageal area, that should come to GI. If they have overt GI bleeding, maybe they have visible blood in the stool, that should come to GI as we know. If they're anemic, especially if they have iron deficiency anemia, that should come to GI. If they're complaining of difficulty swallowing, dysphagia, um, we worry about strictures, uh, masses, that should come to GI. Odynophagia as well, they have painful swallowing. Um, sometimes that could be due to an infectious esophagitis, right? Pill esophagitis, uh, candida esophagitis. That should all come to GI for an investigation. And then, of course, unintentional weight loss. They're all things I think everybody knows. Um, if you remember, though, but back at that case study, keep in mind the what I call some of the alarm or red flags that aren't really listed as alarm or red flags. Middle-aged white males, remember that? Nocturnal symptoms. Um, frequent symptoms, long-term symptoms, they're all, in my opinion, red, GI red flags for me that should, that should also visit GI. Um, and then you see the last bullet, long-standing symptoms or frequent symptoms. Now, the guidelines will state five or more years of uncontrolled reflux uh, should have an endoscopy. My cutoff, my personal cutoff was two years, and I'll show you why on the slide coming up. Next slide. Nocturnal symptoms, again, are important to, uh, to require a GI evaluation of probable endoscopy. Um, and again, the following list on the slide elevates the patient's risk for Barrett's esophagus. We went through this earlier. Older age, middle to older, white males, obese patients, special central obesity, hyaluronic hernias, smoking. And then if a patient has a first degree relative with Barrett's or adenocarcinoma of esophagus, that list puts them at an elevated risk of Barrett's. So one or more of those um, symptoms or signs should be sent to GI for at least at least one endoscopy to make sure there's no underlying Barrett's esophagus. I want to mention too, Barrett's has no symptoms. So Barrett's esophagus will have zero symptoms. It's you're coming to us for reflux symptoms. Once you heal their reflux and they get better symptomatically, they can still have underlying Barrett's, which they won't feel. All right, next slide. When I mention Barrett's, this is what I'm speaking about. This is a, a picture with Barrett's and the salmon colored or the uh, reddish colored mucosa, that is the Barrett's esophagus. The white, the white islands and the more pale colored mucosa, that's the normal squamous cells that should be there. And the entire esophagus should be lined in the white. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing um, the red mucosa migrating up from the stomach into the esophagus. And that is what we do not want to see during endoscopy as a Barrett's esophagus. Next slide. 
this was an old uh, patient of mine years ago who had a very long segment of Barrett's esophagus. And I, I put this in because you could see little islands in the bottom left-hand picture. You could see little islands of squamous cells left over. And the entire esophagus is being replaced by that red salmon-colored uh, mucosa. And that is a long segment of Barrett's esophagus, um, which, of course, Barrett's increases your risk of uh, developing adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Next slide. I put a video in uh, of how we pick up Barrett's esophagus. This is a, one of my patients from years ago. And I, can you play that video, Nicole? Yep, I'm playing it. Do you want oh. me to go back? Yeah, yeah no, play it. Yep, playing it now, so it's moving. So hopefully you're seeing again what you saw in the picture is that you see the tongues of the reddish mucosa in that distal esophagus area. And that is a short segment of Barrett's esophagus. What I just did now is uh, we flicked on narrow band imaging. It's a different type of light reflex that uh, we can put on with the scope. And it, it depicts Barrett's and picks up mucosal details much more readily. Um, so you can see those tongues of columnar epithelium uh, or intestinal metaplasia migrating up from the stomach. And that's what we look for in endoscopy. There's the rugal folds of the stomach that you see. But when we pull the scope back into the distal esophagus, uh, there's your Barrett's mucosa there. Again, there's no ulcerations. There's not many erosions, and that's generally asymptomatic. So that's what we pick up, um, and that's important. And the only way to pick that up is with an endoscopy. Next slide. This graph depicts what I was saying earlier, that um, the guidelines state patients that have five or more years of reflux have a five-fold incidence of having Barrett's esophagus. So that's why the guidelines state five or more years, they would recommend one endoscopy to make sure there's no Barrett's. If you look at that second column, um, my cutoff is two years because between one and five years of chronic symptoms, the, the risk is threefold. And to me, uh, my personal opinion is, I think that's enough risk to warrant an endoscopy between one and five years, not wait till five years. But I teach my, my residents, you know, the board question, the answer would be five years or more of uncontrolled reflux should have at least one endoscopy. Next slide. This was a patient that presented to Mercy Fitzgerald um, years ago. He came in with heartburn and some dysphagia. I did a procedure on him, an upper endoscopy, and there you could see in that picture, he has a small mass, a growth in his distal esophagus. And that is in a background of, a, of a Barrett's esophagus. That was biopsy proven adenocarcinoma. The patient did not want to stay for treatment. He actually signed himself out AMA. So interesting, when we go to the next slide, this is the exact same patient that came back about a year and a half later with complete, you know, totally obstructed. And this was the same area of his esophagus a year and a half later. And this is what adenocarcinoma does in a year and a half for the esophagus. Same patient. It was interesting that I was actually on service and he came at the same time I was covering that hospital again. So this is what Barrett's can lead to. Barrett's can lead to esophageal adenocarcinoma and that's what we want to prevent. Next slide. This is a pictorial explaining why nocturnal reflux bothers me more than daytime reflux. So daytime reflux, you're more upright. Um, you have less contact time of the acid being in contact with the lining of the esophagus. When you're sleeping and having your symptoms at night, you're lying supine. You can see gravity is now taken out of the equation, so gravity cannot pull that acid back down. Um, also, normal physiology when we sleep, we have decreased esophageal acid clearance. We lose gravity. Our swallowing and primary peristalsis of the esophagus is diminished while we're sleeping. We have decreased salivary flow while we're sleeping. We don't realize we have heartburn because we're sleeping, so we sleep through it. You know, during the day, we feel it. We'll go, we'll get up, we'll take a Tums, maybe an antacid, drink some water. Um, but when you're sleeping, you don't sense the heartburn. And also when we're sleeping, we have a lower upper and lower esophageal sphincter pressures and decreased cough reflex. So physiologic, those reasons are why nocturnal heartburn bothers me more than daytime heartburn. Next slide. This was a, an old study, but this was published in the New England Journal back in 1999. And this showed or tried to prove that nocturnal heartburn is, a risk, is an independent risk factor for esophageal adenocarcinoma. 
So we don't talk about this much. I don't hear uh, much about nocturnal heartburn, but that's why I wanted to um, bring this to our attention to notice and be aware if a patient comes in and tells you they're having nocturnal heartburn, I would have a higher suspicion that, you know, I want to take a look down their esophagus and make sure that they do not have Barrett's uh, for the reason we already talked about. Next slide. So these are some of the reasons why patients have acid reflux in a diagram form. So we're starting at the top, they can have defective esophageal clearance. So you have decreased uh, esophageal peristalsis that can uh, allow for more acid to remain up in the esophagus. Patients made with scleroderma, um, motility issues can um, lead to this. Lower esophageal sphincter dysfunction. That is the most common reason why patients have acid reflux. Their LES is dysfunctional. They have a lax LES or they have tr more transient relaxations of their LES than a normal uh, LES patient. They can have a hyaluronic hernia. So you can see the diaphragm and you have some of the stomach herniating through that diaphragm coming up into the thorax or the chest. And that now is... Um, uh, least acid reflux, you've lost one of the barriers. One of the barriers to acid reflux and regurgitation would be that diaphragm. Now, a lax diaphragm now allows stomach tissue to be up in the chest, and um, that is uh, promotes uh, reflux and um, heartburn. And then you could have that increased abdominal pressure, being obese or tight-fitting clothes will then, again, push the pressure, and your LES tries to relax and equalize those pressures up in the esophagus. And then the last thing I want to mention that we seem to... Um, we should think about more is delayed gastric emptying or gastroparesis, right? So sometimes resistant acid reflux, not responding to typical medications, maybe they have another reason for their acid reflux. And gastroparesis, um, I always think about that. And you want to rule them out for that, delayed emptying. Um, most cases of, acid, of delayed emptying or gastroparesis is idiopathic. So I'm going to say that again. Majority of cases of gastroparesis are idiopathic. The second most common cause is diabetes. And I know we all think, oh, well, you're not diabetic, so you probably do not have gastroparesis. That's incorrect. If the most common reason is idiopathic, then anybody can really have gastroparesis. So I have a high suspicion when I cannot control a patient with acid reflux, typical medications, I'll think of gastroparesis and perform the appropriate studies. Next slide. Um, I put this in because I know this comes up a lot. Well, Dr. Lichtenstein, you said proton pump inhibitors are the most potent acid suppressive medications, and you you sometimes use utilize step-in therapy where you put them on a PPI and leave them alone. What about all these side effects of PPIs, and what are the risk factors to my patients with these PPIs, and how do we work, work with that? Well, I, I made a list. This is up to date. Let's look at it. So what about C. difficile? I get that all the time. What about the increased risk of C. difficile and PPIs? Okay. Yes, there is probably an association. What's well, unclear as to why, and I don't think it's that common. I have not seen a resistant case of C. diff, and I have plenty of patients on PPI. So I think if it does occur, it should be treated on a case-by-case -case basis, but that would not be a reason for me to, to not use a PPI when a patient truly needs a PPI. Again, think of those pictures of esophageal adenocarcinoma and Barrett's. I want to prevent that, but I'm not overly concerned about C. difficile. Microscopic colitis, yes, there's probably an association with proton pump inhibitors and microscopic colitis. Microscopic colitis is rare, it's easily treatable, and that would not hinder my use of using PPIs when a patient truly needs it. This comes up quite often, hypergastrinemia. Yes, we, it does cause hypergastrinemia using PPIs, but there is no long-term ill effects in humans. It's only been shown in rats to have gastrocarcinoid um, never been shown in humans after all these years. And this comes up sometimes. There is no increased risk of colon cancer that's been documented by hypergastrinemia. Um, malabsorption. What about they're not a mal, you know, they're malabsorbing their vitamins. What about calcium absorption and uh, bone fractures? Yep. Uh, let's start with magnesium. Yeah, there, it has been shown that uh, patients can malabsorb magnesium. So if a patient truly needs to be on a long term PPI, Check the magnesium levels twice a year. I mean, you're usually doing routine blood work anyway. Check the magnesium levels. Most of the time, they'll be fine. And if they're running low, you can supplement that. Um, calcium, make sure that they're on their calcium and vitamin D to help prevent osteoporosis. Um, the causality has not been proven with PPIs in this, but there is a 1.3 times odds ratio with, with uh, hip fractures and PPIs. Again, I don't think it's enough to not give a patient a PPI 
if they truly needed to help prevent virus esophagus. Next slide. Maybe there's some B12 malabsorption. Maybe there's some iron malabsorption. Again, these are these are possibly, um, but it's probably not of much clinical significance. Kidney disease, I see this pop up from time to time. Yes, there is a slight correlation with acute interstitial nephritis. Um, with chronic kidney disease, that is not known. It may not even be true with proton pump inhibitors. Drug-induced lupus popped up. Yes, there's some case reports, but once you stop the PPI, it usually improves. This came up recently about COVID-19. Is there a higher risk of COVID-19 with PPI use? Unknown. Too early to tell. Uh, next slide. Dementia, unknown. It's conflicting data, cannot say for certain either way. Pneumonia, this has come up since I was an intern and resident, especially in the ICU that they did not want to put patients on acid suppression in fear of nosocomial pneumonias. And to date, in 2021, it's still conflicting. That's never been proven to date. So I would not overly concern myself with that. Um, if a patient truly needs to be on a PPI to control their acid reflux, the current guidelines recommend putting them on that proton pump inhibitor, keeping them at the lowest dose on a regular basis that keeps them symptom free, but that's the current guidelines. And I think being aware of some of these side effects of PPIs is important, but in my opinion, I do not believe any of them outweigh the risks of what I showed you of Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma. Um, And that's all I have. Thanks, Dr. Lichtenstein. That was a great presentation. So um, just a reminder for everyone how to obtain your credits. There's the link in the website um, that are the, the WebEx teams uh, meeting that we sent out earlier. The event number is 44437. Um, you have 30 days to go in and um, claim your continuing education credits. Just make sure you put your name and your full name into the information. Um, and I will take questions for Dr. Lichtenstein at this time. So Dr. Lichtenstein, you were talking about, um, you know, how to, to treat for, um, acid reflux. So should we be starting acid reflux, um, acid suspension treatments in patients before endoscopy? So that's a good question. I get that a lot. So the patient comes to me and they're having heartburn symptoms. Do I want to start them on a medication to treat their acid reflux and then perform an endoscopy after they're treated? Or do I want to withhold treatment and perform an endoscopy to get, quote, like a lay of the land and see what it looks like before I treat. And the answer is the first one. I, I like to start treatment first, get them healed, and then look down their esophagus. Again, I'm more concerned about complications of acid reflux. That's why the patient is getting the procedure to begin with. I'm not overly concerned with trying to document the patient has acid reflux. That's a clinical diagnosis, right? Patient comes in with typical symptoms. You start them on an acid suppressive therapy of your choice, and they get better. That is typically acid reflux. You have just made that diagnosis yourself. What I'm concerned about is ruling out the complications of the reflux, which would be strictures, Barrett's, and anything worse. So remember what I said about grade C and D esophagitis. If I don't treat the patient first, and I scope them, and I see grade C and D esophagitis, well, guess what? They're going to be start on a medication, probably a PPI, and now they're going to come back in eight to 10 weeks for me to scope them again. Great for me, great for my pocket. I get an extra procedure out of the deal and I make more money. Not great for the patient. I don't think that's great patient care. So I think the patient should be treated first and then sent to me and I can uh, scope them once they're treated. Okay. Good question. When is the best time to take a PPI? So the best time to take a PPI, uh, the, the data states on an empty stomach and you want to take that 20 to 30 minutes before their meal. Um, if a patient is having nocturnal symptoms, that PPI should be taken before dinner time. A PPI should never be taken at bedtime. So either they're, they're being started on it once a day in the morning before breakfast, if they're having daytime heartburn, but if they're complaining of nocturnal symptoms, I'll add either a second dose before dinner, or I'll just switch the morning dose and tell them to take it before dinner. PPI should never be taken at bedtime, which I see sometimes. H2 blockers can, but not a PPI. Good question. 
And are you recommending that all reflux patients get an EGD? No, I am not recommending that. That's how I came off saying that. I, no, I, I apologize. Not all reflux patients need an upper endoscopy. Um, I think the ones that I highlighted with the risk factors, the typical risk factors or the red flags, so to speak. And then if you look at that case report, that case study, that would warn an, ED, an EGD. Remember the uh, middle-aged white males, uh, hyaluronic hernias, obesity, nocturnal reflux. So I think you'd have to identify which patients uh, go on to an endoscopy. I, I, I think, you know, being ahead of the curve, you know, I have a low threshold to at least perform one endoscopy to help prevent Barrett's and adenocarcinoma, as you saw in those pictures. So I have a low threshold to do it, but I don't think everybody needs an endoscopy. Steve. Great. Steve. Go ahead, Dr. Reardon. Marty. Yes, Marty. If you have a person who's been on a PPI for, say, 20 years, a low dose, well controlled, they get an endoscopy at some point, it shows no Barrett's, no esophagitis. Is there any need for follow up endoscopy, assuming their symptoms don't change? Yeah, great question. No. The, the, the answer is no. There's no data because what I look at is symptoms. So if, if they have an endoscopy, initial endoscopy, and they have no GERD, no erosions, and the PPI controls their symptoms 100%, and they maintain that symptom free period for 20 years, then technically they're not acid refluxing. So therefore, there's really no reason for me to look. They're not at increased risk of Barrett's because they've maintained their symptom-free years on that PPI. So I would have no reason to say every so often, let's take a look down there. Not if they're well controlled. Where I do recommend it is if they've come off their PPI, you know, they're not compliant, and now, you know, the the, the um, everything. I guess the timeline resets. If they say, Doc, I've been off my PPI. I haven't been a good boy or girl, and I've had reflux off and on for several years. Well, now we go back to square one. I have to repeat the endoscopy to make sure they didn't develop um, Barrett's. But now, as long as they're well controlled, Marty, I don't repeat their endoscopy, and the guidelines do not suggest that either. Good question. I have one last comment. Um, this was a great talk. Your next topic should be NASH versus all of the other forms of fatty liver disease. Okay. You know what? Dhruvan Patel, I had Dhruvan Patel, my new uh, partner. He just gave a great um, NASH lecture to uh, the medical school. I had him deliver one. Um, it was actually for our state Pennsylvania Osteopathic Medical Association conference. Maybe if Nicole can get uh, in with Druven, he can present that next. He's, he has that down. Good. Good suggestion. Any other questions for Dr. Lichtenstein? All right. Well, thank you for your time this afternoon, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, thanks again, Dr. Lichtenstein, for your time, and have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Nicole. Have a great thanks. weekend. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.